Okay, so I don't know if you're intimidated yet. I know I am. So I'm going to throw some more fuel on the fire before we get back into um, looking at all this stuff from another angle. <clears throat> we just closed out by noting that you've got the same option that Satan had. And God has extended that to everybody in church that honors Christ. And it's in your face to Satan and the fallen angels. Since God's not petty, the reason for doing it this way, and the verse that I was quoting was Colossians 2, 14 and especially 15. That particular verse is telling you what I've been saying. My pastor, like everything else I've been saying, my pastor taught all this stuff. And the reason I'm able to even articulate it this well is I spent about 10 years auditing what he said so I could test it for sense in scripture. Links in the video description will uh, show the results of that analysis. It's extremely long. But the point is, is that God isn't going to be throwing all this in Satan's face post-cross when Christ has already won strategically and now it's just the tactical victory of replacing Satan and company. He's not doing that to like stick the knife in. Okay? Like, like Peter says, it's God's will that nobody perish. That's another verse that you can use to show that, yeah, hell lasts forever, but it's not God's will that people be there. Okay, but if it's not God's will that people be there and they are there, you've only got one of two conclusions. Okay? If it keeps on going, if there's such a thing as a hell that keeps on going, then it can only mean that the people want to be there. The people, the angels. They aren't changing their mind. It also can only be that they can get out. Okay? So relative to heaven, there is a loss of population that is made up. In this case, the population lost are the demons and, of course, all the unbelievers. People. Humans. Okay. The whole population of everybody ever born still exists. Everybody was paid for by Christ because God has to be paid for all sin. So everybody still exists. And therefore the ones that aren't in the kingdom of heaven can get in. So Satan and company are being given an in-your-face, because that's all the, that's the only language they like now. They're all pushy now. All those years of stubbornness, you get pushy. So God is playing to their language. We're pushy. We're in his face. Each one of us can get the inheritance that they lost. And they lost it because they abdicated. It's kind of like what Paul is saying about the Jews in Romans 9 through 11. Is that by seeing us get this higher inheritance, maybe they will become jealous. We're talking unbelieving Jews now. Not the Messianics or saved just like we are. That the, the, those who don't believe in Christ as Messiah, that they will be sort of like jealous seeing what we get and they want to have it too so they believe too okay the messianics are just as much part of church as so called Christians they just call themselves by a different name they're a little confused about the fact that the covenant changed but Romans 14 and 13 and 15 tell you that you can observe 
your faith in Christ post-salvation any way you want. Because we're being turned into kings. The king determines the policy. You're king over your own world right now. You are given the authority as far as the effect on world history of a king right now. How you use your time down here determines history now. So you determine how you want to worship, learn Christ. That's your soul determination. It is a kingly function. Exact opposite of the Mosaic Law. Mosaic Law was cookie cutter. God wrote it out and they had to observe it. Now it's just the opposite. Everything about church is the opposite of what it was under Israel. In Israel it was outer to inner. You did outer things to learn inner stuff in your soul. Now you learn inner stuff in your soul first before you do the outer. That's why works are so devastating. It's just the opposite. The outer stuff, the rituals, all that stuff in the Old Testament was done like training aids. The whole temple structure was the Bible and architecture, for example. And you looked at the things and you put two and two together metaphorically and you determined stuff about God. And on top of that, scripture was gradually being reduced to writing. Okay? And that's the promise in Jeremiah 31. When the new covenant comes, it's going to all be written. Which is why the book of Hebrews is explaining, Hi, this is the new covenant. But because Israel rejected Christ, church is the bridge. Church has got its own new covenant, replacing not Israel, but the demons. It's got our own covenant based on Psalm 110. Battlefield royalty. That's why Paul talks about two walls in Ephesians 2. We don't replace Israel. Catholicism and Calvinism think we replace Israel. No. We replace the demons. Colossians 2.15 That's a one-on-one -on -one triumphal procession. It's a cultural reference that happened in Rome every time that the troops returned home. The general got this triumphal procession and you had your prisoners and there was one soldier per prisoner and they marched into the Mamertine dungeon and then at that point the prisoners were either killed or sold off. So one on one, believer in church, for every demon, we're replacing the demons. We are not replacing Israel. But anybody who's a Jew who believes during church is part of church and might call himself a Jew, might call himself Messianic. You can call yourself, I don't know, the underwear religion if you want. Did you believe in Christ? Okay, then you observe any way you want. In other words, the Mosaic Law is no longer the mandate. But doesn't prevent you from using it. Okay? I happen to like certain provisions that were in the Mosaic Law. Just, I like them. I'm not required to use them. But to me, it's a sort of memorial. It's, so, it's just meaningful and I just enjoy it. And that was kind of part of my upbringing too. Alright? But it's not required. The, the, the Messianics don't realize that it's not required. They had the same problem in the first century. That's where Paul comes in. And that's where the book of Hebrews comes in the most. Because it's explaining, look, it's a different covenant. Church is a different group. Based on Psalm 110.1. And then it becomes a bridge to realize Jeremiah 31. So time will bridge back to the Jews in the tribulation and millennium. Meanwhile, and that's where Romans... 9 through 11 comes in. Meanwhile, anybody who's a Jew who believes in Christ is part of church. That also is covered in Galatians 3 through 5. Because it's a big topic of confusion to people just after Christ died. Even James was confused about it. Do we continue the law? And they had all that stupid fakakta nonsense going on in Acts 15 about what well, they came up with, you know, sort of like the Noah garbage. 
which was never the law under Noah, okay? That's somebody's invention in the Middle Ages. They don't even call it Noahic in Acts 15. It's somebody else's invention about what it was. But the point is, is they came up with this little nonsense that sort of, you know, Mosaic law light to impose on the Gentiles. And Paul said, no, that's not true. The law was fulfilled by Christ, Romans 10.4. It's different now. It's higher. It's upgraded to the royal law, which James finally understood. In James 2.8, that's what he calls it. The law of liberty, the law of grace, the law of Christ, royal law. Different covenant. And that's what the book of Hebrews is, is designed to explain. Christ is King Kata Melchizedek. Melchizedek was like the, the the legal precedence that's used. Well, Melchizedek was of Abraham's day that preceded Israel. Okay, and it's a very... It's, if you understand law, this would make a lot of sense to you if you first few times you read it. But if you don't understand law, it's going to be kind of hard to understand. The point is that we are a different priesthood. We are a different kingship. We have a different covenant. We have a different high priest. As the book of Hebrews says, Christ is not of the right tribe to be a Levitical priest. It's entirely different. But at the same time, you know, it's better, Crichton, Attic Crichton. But at the same time, it's related. And it's designed really to protect Israel. Okay, so, here you are, a king in training, under the king of kings and you have this separate covenant called church but you can observe it any way you want you can ignore any parts of it you want you're in a king in training you you make the rules that's the scary part just the opposite of mosaic law okay so since you make the rules one of the rules you can make is you can call somebody papa and have a Catholic church. Now, how good that is, or how bad that is relative to the Bible, well, that's between you and God. But you do have the right to do that. By contrast, you can start up a shul and call somebody rabbi and observe the law from the Old Testament, but be messianic. You got that choice too. And whether or not you're actually sticking closely to the Bible, well, that's something between your maker and you. In other words, each congregation or group of congregations, if they want to band together, can interpret the Bible any way they want because everybody in there is technically in training to become a king. Now, who's going to actually make kingship is going to be determined at the end at the end of each person's life, he knows if he passed or failed. And obviously, if you're screwing up your interpretation of Bible, you ain't going to make it. That's why I keep harping on be in the system. Be whatever denomination you want. That's a conscience between God and you. But be in the system. Because the minute you get out of the system... And don't get back in when John 1 9. And then you're in deep doo doo. It's not about what you get right and wrong today, it's about whether you're in the system. Now, I mean, I have to say this, okay? I know Bible really, really, really well. I've been in it for 40 years, not that that really matters a whole lot, but I got really high quality teaching from my pastor. He taught more Bible in one week than most people get in 49 years. So I got far less excuse than anybody else for not making it. At the same time, if I'm not in God's system, what do you think God's going to do to me? So on the one hand, I got a better chance of making it to the end, but there's no guarantee. And on the other hand, when I screw up, 
it's got a bigger cursing that goes with it. So I have to be more careful. And I'm still not better than anybody else. I'm probably worse. It's not based on how good I am. It's based on the information God's doing to me. In other words, the world's getting blessed because brain out is here. Yeah, that's true. Okay, but it's not brain out that's causing the blessing. It's God doing something to brain out that's justifying the blessing. Really important difference. You know, we all look around and we see certain people are rich, certain people are poor, certain people are healthy, certain people are sick, and we inevitably, because we've got sin natures, inevitably we fall to thinking, well, so-and-so doesn't deserve that. Or when something bad happens, oh, he didn't deserve that. It's not about deserving. I don't deserve that God should slap my name on blessing. He is to my periphery. I don't deserve that. But he does. That's how you got to think about it. You're a king in training. You didn't deserve that. But he does. You can say yes. You can say no. There's going to be cursing if you say no. There's going to be blessing if you say yes. And you didn't deserve either one. But that's your lot in life. You know, the people who were born physically royal in this life, they were born into it. They didn't earn it. Yeah, and then they got this ball and chain they got to carry around. Every little thing they do, which is going to lead me into the purpose of this audio, every little thing they do is watched, aped, commented on, put in the news. They live in a glass house simply because they were born into a royalty. Why? Because all the little peasants got to look at the royals to learn anything. That's just how we are as humans. You got peasants and you got royals. And the peasants are always gawking at the royals. Oh, she's wearing a, a blue silk dress. They're not learning anything about the principles of royalty. They're only looking at the dress. And somebody's going to look at that same blue silk dress and going to make a knockoff of it and make a lot of money trying to imitate the dress. And why is that even happening? Because some royal person actually wore the dress. So the person wearing the dress just spawned a whole industry of dressmaking just by wearing it. Welcome to the pitfalls of royalty. Everything you do is being watched, commented on. Everything you do wrong is being watched, commented on in heaven and to a certain extent on earth. Simply because you're a believer in Christ, period, over and out. You can like it, you can lump it, you can do whatever you want, but you're born royal, you got your got crown prince or princess on your name. And you just don't have a choice in the matter that's how it plays. You live in a glass wall too. And you can cry about it, you can laugh about it. That's how it is. You're part of the body of Christ, for better and for worse. And better and worse is going to happen in this world, based on whether you learn Him. So you can choose to be any sect of Judaism or Christianity you want. You can stop calling it Christian Jewish, you can call it Buddhist if you want. But you're still saved. You're still a Christian. You can even say you're an atheist now. Does not matter. All of heaven is watching us. Waiting to see which ones are going to become the kings. Just like the world watches the royals down here. Oh, they went off to Saint-Tropez. So... Give them a break. Let them have their privacy for crying out loud. No, they don't get any privacy. Every 
little thing they do, every little thing they wear, every little thing they say is aped, looked at, commented on, judged. Because they're royal. That's it. And Satan and company are busy pointing us out, especially when we screw up, to justify those who don't believe in Christ or to justify those who are carnal remaining that way. So that's this, the, the last dimension of this, is we have to recognize, and, and when I say you, I mean me, I, this is my biggest hang-up in the spiritual life, that's why I'm talking it out. I have to recognize, and it's kind of the reason why I do make audios and videos, I'm not my own. I'm a public person, I'm not a private person. A peasant is a private person. He does his job from 9 to 5, he goes home, his time, his life is his own. Okay, but you're royal, you're not a you're not a private person. Even when you're sitting on the toilet, somebody's watching you to see if you screw up. Now, what are you gonna do? Get all wigged out about that? Can demons read our thoughts? Of course they can. If they couldn't read our thoughts, then Satan could accuse God of you know, not making sufficient information disclosed, not giving him enough chance to prove his points. They have to be able to read our thoughts. I'm sure that it's, you know, something like the divine broadcasting system where they can tune in when they want. In, in other words, I don't think they can natively read our thoughts, but they can tune in through something that God provides. But they have to be able to do that in order to have a fair shot with their arguments in the trial. Okay? Now, you are therefore on public display. So am I right now. I have no idea how many angels, demons, maybe even people in heaven. Because, I mean, you know, this is a stadium. Angels are craning their necks to look, Peter said. We're in a stadium. Paul talked about how we were in a stadium. No, I'm, I can't remember. I think it's in 2 Corinthians somewhere. Where he's basically saying, you know, we the, we the apostles and the teachers, you know, we're the ones who are, you know, being laughed at. Yeah, we're all in a stadium. Heaven is watching us. You go to the bathroom, who knows how many demons decided to perch on your shoulder. They're not really that small, but they can make themselves be any size or look. While you pee. Well, when you go to the bathroom, they don't think about your nakedness the way you do. They feel sorry for you. They really do. They feel sorry that you're stuck with this small life. They blame God for your small life. They're not sexually interested in an animal. Because that's what they think of us. The elect angels, on the other hand, have you know, a lot of empathy for us. And they're rooting for us. And I, you know, I'm speculating about this, but if the angels are watching, it seems to stand a reason that the humans would be too. So every once in a while, I just wave up to the ceiling, you know, to my dead relatives, just for the heck of it. I don't know if they're watching. I don't know why they'd want to. But this is not about brain out or you. It's about what God does to us. We are being worked on by God. So it's not about how small we are and how ugly we are when we're naked in the shower. It's about what information is coming into our head and under what circumstances are we lose, using it and how are we applying it and what does it mean. It's, it, they're watching a movie, just like, you know, you turn on your TV, you like to watch a movie of other people living. 
Even if you're seeing them in the bathroom, you're not thinking about the crudeness of the bathroom. You're identifying with their circumstances. Well, that's what the people in heaven are doing. When I say people, I mean angels. Okay. You're on, you're, you're Christ on trial. You're part of Christ, you're on trial, period. Trial is public. Trial is a stadium. Two meanings, legal meaning and, you know, gladiator meaning. 